Uh, this is Ryan Nagy. I wanted to talk for a moment about um, Feldenkrais and politics and the Feldenkrais Guild and some of these uh, blog posts that I do from time to time about you know dynamics of the Feldenkrais Guild and the Feldenkrais Guild system because people have occasionally asked me you know why I do it what's the point um, or as one person put <laughs> on a Facebook comment why do you keep bringing this crap up man uh, and, and it's a legitimate question and I, and I know if I I think a lot of you get it and I think I've blogged a little bit about it in the past, but I just want to make it really, really clear that, you know, this, you know, rabble rousing that I'm doing, or I just call it telling the truth or reporting things, but it's not about just creating ruckus or drawing attention to myself or something, as somebody wrote to me in an 80 page email. Um, sorry, no, an 80 page letter. And I need to show you this letter that someone wrote me. Uh, uh, a Feldenkrais person. He's not a part of the guild, but he does trainings in Europe and somehow, yeah, doesn't like what I'm doing. Um, but, you know, it's really to me about implications for your work and my work. It has implications for your development, for your independence, for your you know economic independence, emotional dependence. I mean, it's a really important thing, and I, w I want people to get it. I'm not saying the guild is bad, and I'm not saying that if you choose to, to follow the guild protocols uh, that you're somehow wrong or bad. I'm just saying to, to be aware of it. Um, you know, historically, people have been creating this myth that Moshe created the Feldenkrais Guild and he wanted a strong guild to promote his work and there's trainers out there to say, oh, I, I registered the service marks on Moshe's behalf and I did nothing unwrong or fraudulent, blah, blah, blah. But, and that's fine that people want to create that mythology. I think it's very dishonest. But the, but the issue is, is you know, you, you go through a training or you don't go through a training. You do, you know, you do some work on your own and you want to put yourself out there and use these principles. And somebody comes down and says, oh, no, no, you can't do that. That's wrong. Right. Or, you know, a practitioner takes a training and wants to start doing something like teaching the little bits of functional integration, you know, teaching people to do the work which is a, a normal, natural transition. It's just, it's, it's, just, it's just part of development. That is the Feldenkrais method. You know, you're experimenting, you're learning, you try new behaviors. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to grow as a person. Someone says, whoa, whoa, you can't do that. You know, why? You know, you're not a Feldenkrais trainer. Well, you know, what is a Feldenkrais trainer? What is, I mean, think about it. What is a Feldenkrais trainer? Um, uh, uh, in an honest moment, you can talk to some trainers out there that will say, well, you know, Moshe was dead. We had to call ourselves something. <laughs> okay. But it's true. They did have to call themselves something. Um, so, you know, Moshe died. You had some of the students who, you know, they didn't have their own credentials. They hadn't written any books, most of them. They, hadn't, they didn't really have their own center of gravity. And, you know, they got a hold of Moshe's service marks, uh, legally or illegally, and they started putting selves, themselves out there as being these direct descendants of Moshe. And, you know, and, and, yeah, I think a lot of you know the story, and then there's people like Mia Seagal that actually did have approval from Moshe, and there was Yochanan who really refused to be a part of the guild, and eventually Anap Banyal, and... You know, those, those people, because they're practicing independently, you know, using their own name and their own service marks and their own way of being in the world, those people are somehow bad or wrong. So, you know, I don't want to keep harping on it. And quite frankly, it takes a lot of energy for me to sit down and do any type of blogging on it or, or video blogging on it because it's, it's a little bit boring. But I just really want to make it clear to you that... You know, any restrictions that are placed on you to do this work, 
if they're not at the state or local legal you know level i mean they're about they're about somebody else they're about somebody else controlling controlling the training process keeping the money to themselves i mean it's been what 35 years since moshe's death and we've got like 78 79 trainers or something like that it's this long impossible process to become a trainer and then you know there's even, you know there's a hierarchy within the feldenkrais method right but you know there's practitioners and then there's assistant trainers and trainers but a lot of people don't realize once you get within that so-called you know trainer phase there's hierarchy with hierarchies within the trainers so you get certified as a trainer and then what well you can't do your own training shame on you you need an educational director you got to go to jerry Carson to do that or david barrison so it's just this long drawn out thing that limits people's you know emotional independence right if you spent 15 if you spend 15 20 years of your life getting someone's approval to do something that you can do right now on your own i don't find that very healthy maybe that's exactly what someone needs that's fine i sure as hell wouldn't live my life that way and i know a lot of other people don't want to do it either you know it makes the trainings more expensive it limits the development of new training module um training methods and it's a mess i mean who in the i mean so anyway i just want to put that out there I blog about that stuff because I think it's important for you. You're, I want you to have as much freedom as you want to have in the development of your work, your method. And I constantly return to that. Your work, your method. If you, know, if you can do it, then it, you own it. Nobody owns the movements. They haven't been patented. They're not trademarked. Okay? The, the, the service marks are trademarked. That's it. Um... Somebody accused me a while back of stealing somebody else's ATMs. Like, how do you, how do you steal an ATM, bro? Um, I, I didn't respond. It. Well, I, I guess I guess I'm responding now, but I was like, yeah, whatever. So, um, as usual, I'm rambling here. What else do I want to cover? Um, yeah, that's about it. So you may not agree with me. You may think I'm an idiot. That's fine. But the, the restrictions placed upon the work uh, uh, are not about Moshe. Uh, and Moshe made it very clear. If, you, if, you're, if you're listening to this on RyanNagy.com, click the button up uh, that way, which says the critical mindset shift, if it's still there. And Moshe had a very, very clear statement about this. And he, Moshe is on your side. Um, um, what, there's one other thing I wanted to co uh, c cover, and it's, it, it keeps eluding me. Um, bum, 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 bum. Anyway, that's it for now. So, you know, if I offend you, I apologize. Uh, but I think this stuff is very important. And, uh, you know, sometimes I offend people and they go away and they don't read my blog anymore. And that's good. I only want you to be here if, it's, if I'm saying something valuable to you. Ah, I know what it was. You know, some of us, we have identities as Feldenkrais practitioners. It's just, it's sort of baked into our being. We, we think of ourselves as a Feldenkrais practitioner or a Feldenkrais trainer, whatever. And, and people say, well, if the guild goes away or if the trainers go away, what will happen to that? Well, you know, nothing will happen to it. You'll still be a Feldenkrais practitioner or you'll be, you'll be, some, still be someone who's using the principles of this work and you and me and other people we can create our own sort of organization or our own way of being that respects you and respects me and respects the next people coming down the pike um i also want to say if you want to be a part of the feldenkrais guild or s some other organization because you need you know the legal protection you need some type of a way to hang out your shingle and say oh i'm not a massage therapist i do you know feldenkrais whatever that's awesome, you know, do it. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying don't do that. Um, but, you know, keep in mind there are other organizations out there. Um, and I'm blanking on them right now. There are other sort of somatic organizations where you could join and you can get health insurance and you can get the right to call yourself something. Uh, or you can do what I do, and I don't have uh, anybody's authority or uh, a need. I got this really angry email. It's like, well, if you, 
you know, Ryan, if you continue in your apparent attempt to destroy the Feldenkrais Guild, how will you make a living? Huh? Yeah, I'll make a living the way I'm doing it right now, which is being uh, as, as honest and as true as I can to myself and my ideals and your ideals. And uh, so, anyway, I hope you're doing fantastic out there, and I just wanted to get that out there. And... Uh, See you in the, the real world, I hope, at some point. <laughs>
And the second stage is where he uses the right arm and the right leg, then the left arm and the left leg. It means he oscillates from right to left. Now, all this, he does more than once. He does 50, 100 trials in each. And his way of learning is this. Each one he finds with every new attempt that he has found something which is simpler, easier until he finds that he was doing that too much and that too little, and then somehow he finds a modicum of movement which to him feels really comfortable. And that's he learns. But the cerebral palsy child is handicapped because he cannot reproduce the same movement twice. He is spastic and cannot use his legs or arms as he, at will. Therefore, his attempts are never really producing something which by any stretch of imagination you could get to a, a position where you could choose from the different attempts a better one because they never resemble themselves sufficiently. Now, if you want to see a miracle, folks, stay with us. What is the unique Feldenkrais contribution to the treatment of cerebral palsy? So you see from what I told you before, now the, my intervention is that I produce a reproducible movement, which the child himself can't do. So I hold him and make a movement which he can see for 10, 15 times exactly the same. And therefore, he has the possibility of learning like other children learn because he has something which is more or less identical and in that he can find a slight improvement from one to the other. Therefore his brain actually catches up to become more or less normal and use the normal procedure of learning. Now my object is to reproduce such moment that can be repeated for 50, 20, 100 times, which will look almost exactly the same like with a normal child. So you are re-educating his nervous yeah, system. Yes, I re-educate his nervous system to begin to learn like other children learn normally. We now have the privilege of watching a film that Moshe Feldenkrais did with young Jonathan Hughes, age four and a half, a victim of cerebral palsy. Watch and see what Dr. Feldenkrais has accomplished. Now this is Jonathan, he is four and a half years old and look the relation of me, look I talk to the child and not to the mother, it's important of making that kind of relation with the boy to feel that he is the most important subject there, not his mother and not anybody else. He has cerebral palsy. He can't walk and you will see he can't speak and actually you wouldn't know whether he's brain damaged or what it is because at four and a half years he can't do all that. Obviously he's not a normal child. He has been treated all the time. You will see he can't, he, he can't sit up straight, you'll see he bends crouches, he has very weak muscles in the back and no ability to do anything. You see, I put the boy on his back and I have found that his feet, he has no control over his feet and you will see in a minute that he really, he has no control over his feet. But there is no hurry, I never push or make the child feel that he is treated, that he is something being done to him. I do him all the good I can within the time allotted. This child never stood on his feet and therefore his brain has never made the patterns of action and reaction to standing on the feet. And he can't do anything. You can see his legs don't obey him, his back doesn't obey him, nothing. Therefore I put an artificial floor on his feet and try to produce the irritation that would happen if he stood on his feet and were working on an inclined plane, on any other sort of changing ground, so as to form some sort of connections in that brain as if he were actually experiencing normal child's working. Now watch how that flaw is applied. It is gentle, it does to the foot 
the kind of changes that you can see now the foot stands as on an inclined plane. And then you turn the inclination until there is a positive response from the nervous system that these irritations have actually altered the organization of the motor cortex. Now, as you can see, now you can bend his legs towards himself and his arms, if you noted before, look, his arms behaved something in connection with the movement of his legs. Watch, and you will see there is a difference between one arm and the other. And gradually, if you watch now, you will see that I make the response to the movement of the legs equal in both arms. Now, once you get that, you see, can you see he has no back muscles. He can't sit up, he doesn't know how to use the legs that are now a little bit better organized. And then you will see what we do. We move him to the right and slowly make sure that he leans on his elbow, but rationally, that he can do it in order to roll on his back easily, which he can never do, he never did. Look, and you will see, when I move him, look, he can't move the head, he doesn't lean on his elbow. And gradually, he will actually lean consciously on his elbow. You will see that, it takes a few minutes, but you will see him doing that. And therefore, look, and you will see he will be helped his head will be helped to assume the normal relationship. In other words, help him to form the pattern of rolling to the side and using his leg, you can see, like two normal legs. It's actually astonishing to see that things like that happen so quick. Look, can you see, he doesn't use his elbow. And look to the other side, he wouldn't use his elbow either. And gradually you move the head, look, you will see he will become aware how to use the head and actually lean on his elbow. Oh, can you see he turned his head now with, with his face to the floor. And you will see on the other side he does it already. Now watch and see that now only about 25 minutes of work he already will lean on the elbow by himself. Watch there, look. Can you see, he leans on the elbow himself like a normal child. Therefore, the pattern and what I was talking is actually working. We've just watched part one of one of the most unique films that I've ever seen, and we will be seeing part two in the next segment. Moshe, that was extraordinary. Well, it is extraordinary, but quite ordinary, because it happens with every case like that. And the real thing through the film, if you watch, for the following thing, that I am substituting myself for an environment to make the child who has cerebral palsy and has therefore spasticity and unformed joints who cannot reproduce a movement closely identical to one another so that he can have some of learning ability. Sometimes he puts his hand to the right and he goes to the left. He doesn't know where it's coming. Now, I produce invariant movements. And we make them as closely resemble one another as what happens with a normal child. And therefore, in a 50 or 100 repetitions, that child finds now the means of learning the way other normal children who have not brain damage and no trouble do actually learn. That's so where he learns too. Please stay with us for part two of Jonathan Hughes. We're back with Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais. Moshe, from what I could gather from what you said the last segment, we are re-educating this child's nervous system. Of course, but there's a very important thing to note. As he is, he cannot avoid thinking that he has brain damage because he's unable to learn, his joints are not used, he cannot learn like other children, obviously brain damage. But what sort of brain damage? By, by minimizing the variability of his actions and make him capable of suddenly realizing that he can learn, he finds himself that his brain damage is minimized. He has actually been able to learn in an hour 
more than an average child can learn in an hour. And therefore you will see in the end the hilarity, the feeling of, of joy, of internal thing is extraordinary, immense. And this brain damage is minimized. We'll now experience part two of Jonathan Hughes. Now you can see now that we have made some sort of patterns relating the hands to the knees. We actually uh, will be able to produce a crawling movement for the first time in his life. Watch, he believes, begins to move his hand and you will see I will irritate, produce such irritation on his body that he will and make it for him the first movement for the first time in his life he will push forward and actually produce a crawling movement you see now his hand coordinates with the foot and now when i move the foot look he makes the crawling movement by himself in other words you can see that this works beyond any expectation it's only about 40 minutes now since the beginning Watch now, you can see he coordinates now the movement of his hand with the knees. And you will see a minute, a minute maybe before that, look, that's it. Knee and hand together, standing, pushing. Look what he does with his left hand. Look, he's trying to crawl with his hand. Now, can you see that movement? That he never done it in his life before. Now watch, I am producing continuously trying to make the child's movement forward look I push him pull him back so that he has a greater intent of moving forward and you will see that his face begins to show extraordinary avidity go for and smiles he is not in pain but watch and you will see in a few seconds what happens until he goes so much forward watch and catches the head and then I will pull him until both hands catch it. Watch. Now he holds with such power that you can't detach him. Listen to his screaming. Listen, listen to the joy. Then watch if we only put him back. Look. Can you see the whole thing lasted about an hour and five minutes. And that's a major change in the entire organization of that child a cerebral palsy child for four years who has never been able to do that sort of thing. Moshe, I cannot believe what I just saw on the screen. Hmm. That child was, it was like a miracle. Yeah, well, it is in a sense a miracle, but it is, has nothing to do with miracle. It's, the whole thing is improvised, yet it's as precise as a scientific experiment and is repetitive. It can be done 99 times of 100 with the same result. By Moshe or by, by me or by, even by, by any Chinese? of my students. The qualified students can do the same thing. Now, the important thing is to see that we act on a child like that as a human being, both in his emotional state and his relation to his mother. You give him importance to himself, not talking to his mother, but to him, approaching him. And in the end, you can see that the child feels actually such an immense change and confidence in himself, and he, in one hour, he becomes so friendly that he stretches out to a stranger to embrace him and caress him and actually kiss him in a way as you have seen yourself. That was probably the first kiss that he gave anyone. Oh, anybody his outside. Life. His mother maybe kissed him, but he, for the first time, a stranger who he met for the first time for an hour, you can see the tremendous internal satisfaction and 
really incredible. In that sense, it's miraculous to see how clever the human nervous system is and how clever even a damaged brain can learn. Okay, so if this changes in one situation, another situation, another say ten times, twenty times, fifty times, it's not that the spasticity may not return, but it becomes one of another possibility. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Right. Sure. It doesn't mean that spasticity is something in the brain. And it's not that it you will completely disappear. Okay? What is the unique Feldenkrais contribution to the treatment of cerebral palsy? So you see from what I told you before, now the, my intervention is that I produce a reproducible movement, which the child himself can't do. So I hold him and make a movement which he can see for 10, 15 times exactly the same. And therefore, he has the possibility of learning like other children learn because he has something which is more or less identical and in that he can find a slight improvement from one to the other. Therefore his brain actually catches up to become more or less normal and use the normal procedure of learning. Now my object is to reproduce such moment that can be repeated for 50, 20, 100 times, which will look almost exactly the same like with a normal child. So you are re-educating his nervous yeah, system. I, I re-educate his nervous system to begin to learn like other children learn normally. That things like that happen a quick look. Can you see? He doesn't use his elbow. And look to the other side. He wouldn't use his elbow either. And gradually you move the head. Look. You will see he will become aware how to use the head and actually lean on his elbow. Oh, can you see he turned his head now with, with his face to the floor. And you will see on the other side he does it already. Now watch and see that now only about 25 minutes of work he already will lean on the elbow by himself. Watch there, look. Can you see, he leans on the elbow himself like a normal child. Therefore, the pattern and what I was talking is actually working. Spasticity is something in the brain. And it's not that it you will completely disappear. How many lessons would Jonathan Hughes have to have to be able to make really 
uh, not that he made profound improvements, amazing improvements oh, in an I hour, but to make... children in on the East in... in the, after that first experience, the way he learned, if I had him for a month daily, I am almost certain that I can put him on his feet and they will stand. You have mentioned in many of your books that we are using only a small portion of our nervous system. Your principle here is to reactivate or to energize various other parts of the nervous system that we're not that using. Is, that, that has in, in the new book, in the Lucifobius, it's put a bit more uh, in detail to understand. Most people develop their ability almost to their, to their potential uh, endowment in those parts in, on which they build their life. For instance, a, a surgeon 
will build his life on those qualities of his brain which he has developed best. Uh, a musician, the same thing. Uh, anybody. You see? The question is that this is done haphazardly, haphazardly, and therefore many other parts which in fact could improve even his, the best part of him are not developed by, but by chance and sometimes not at all. Therefore, it's important that normal people should learn awareness the moment in order to get at least the benefit of what they can get and they wouldn't know even that they didn't have it. And we'll be right back with Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais. Ak, we dealt with a child, or you dealt with a child with cerebral palsy. Will these techniques work for a child with multiple sclerosis or other diseases? Oh, it, it will work also with hemiplegia, and it will work with, with muscular dystony or, or, or dystrophy. And many, many hundreds of different, and in accidents, in, in damage produced by car accidents. In other accidents, in sport accidents, it will work with every, in every one. You can evoke and encourage and put back into function those vital forces which the person doesn't know even that he has and he doesn't know how to use them. Once you give them that ability, there is not a person who does not improve. How far he will go? That depends on the circumstances and on the skill of the teacher.
Can't take it. Goodbye. You're not done. Hold tight. Lift your hand, that's nice. By the way, you didn't see the improvement of the use of his hands in crawling. That's why I did, actually. You learned an enormous hey! Come on, use your hands. That's marvelous. Marvelous. Come on, here. Jonathan. Hello? Hello? Can take Ready to go, Neil? Do you have a good time? Yeah. Okay, can you turn over on your back? Oh my god. Can you turn over on your back? Oh, that, there's no bed that way. Hello. Oh my god. Hello. Um, we'll do one more time later. Mommy play too, okay? Can I play too? No, look, look, look. Uh, eh? 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 Ooh. So thank you That's very right. much. You don't have to thank you. Already thank me. Look, 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 look. Uh, uh, mm. Go away. Yes, we have to go away. Okay? Bye. <laughs> Say, I know. It's hard to end when you're having a good time. Bye. I thank you on his behalf because obviously he did the greatest part of the work. The achievement is his, not mine. <laughs> eh? I, was a, I was instrumental to make him an environment for the first time that allowed him to catch up a little bit of the kind of thing he missed by the ignorance and stubbornness and inability to think of the people around him. And by the way, I told you that you don't know what you're learning. You will only realize that 30 years from now.
Oh. Noch mal drauf, komm, stell dich noch mal drauf. Nicht mehr? Komm, probieren wir es noch mal. Noch mal drauf. Ja, super. Ja. Ich habe auch eine ganz tolle Neuigkeit für Sie. Gestern ist der Karl gelaufen. mit dem. Wir haben so einen kleinen Puppenwagen, so einen, wie ein Kinderwagen, nur klein für Puppen hat sich seine Schwester reingesetzt, die passt gerade noch rein, und er hat sie geschoben. Drei Meter hin und drei Meter zurück wieder. Ja. Das, war, das war toll. Ja. Da war der, der Kinderwagen, also dieser Puppenwagen, war halt dann entsprechend schwer und ist gut gestanden und nicht gekippt. Ja. Und er konnte dann gut sich da abstützen und halt laufen. Also ganz toll. Ja? Du, jetzt ziehen wir dich aber erst aus, Karl. So können wir uns nicht bewegen. Komm, ziehen wir mal die Jacke aus. Auf. Ich nee. merkt, dass da so ein Gefälle ist. Ja. Das, der Boden ist jetzt irgendwie schräg an der Stelle. Ja. Ja? Ja. Du bist ja schon da. Das ging aber schnell. Hm? Ach, oh, was hast denn du da erwischt? 